Now, the animal data kind of scales it all up a bit. A 2015 Journal of Biological Chemistry study by Beam et al. fed rats linoleic acid-rich diets. Insulin resistance was observed, and in particular, they, they, in particular, they looked at insulin resistance in the heart and found that there was evidence of it. A 2020 um, paper published in the journal Scientific Reports gave mice soybean oil. Obesity, insulin resistance went up, and there was also, importantly, a threefold increase in some of the peroxidation products like 13-HODE and 9-HODE. That was the HODE oxylipin that I mentioned earlier in the liver. So huge increases in the level of these peroxidation products in the liver of these mice. But just to compare it to another group, mice in the same study that were fed a diet enriched with coconut oil fared much better, not only gaining less weight, but maintaining better insulin signaling. So things are getting a little more complicated. Now, when we get to humans, it actually gets even more complicated. So the cell evidence suggested with, with all of the clarity that is largely only capable with cell cultures, that linoleic acid itself wasn't, didn't appear to be a problem, but its peroxidation products were. When you were feeding the animals diets high in seed oils, enriched with linoleic acid, of course, things appeared to be a little more consistent, that the animals were developing insulin resistance. Now, with humans, again, it does get complicated. Um, you can, with a lazy search of databases, get a lot of correlational studies. Correlational studies, of course, are based on questionnaires, and they are so unreliable, either because of the nature of the questionnaire itself, the nature of the response from the test subjects and their ability to recall what they eat perfectly, or even, unfortunately, a bias of the scientific group. They're so unreliable that I am honestly not even going to waste my time or your time to review them. I don't think any nutrition decision should ever be based on a correlation study, and I have very low regard for such tools. So I only want to rely on clinical studies with direct interventions and clear outcomes. But that, of course, narrows it down. And there's not a lot of studies that we can rely on. And every one of them is confounded by the fact that they use diets that are always high in carbohydrates as well. So to put a fine point on this and make it clear, I'm unaware of any diet that has used primarily a low carbohydrate approach, and then compared different fats. So what would it look like if you had a group of humans eating ketogenic diets that was in one group perhaps enriched with soybean oil as the main fat and another enriched with you know, animal fats or fruit fats like coconuts or olives? I'm unaware of any study that has ever done this, so we have to consider this. And I'm going to come back to that consideration after I review some of these studies. And I can already imagine the gnashing of teeth that's going to come from reviewing these, but I hope I'm going to be able to provide some nuance and context at the end of it all. So firstly, let's consider a 2002 study from Diabetologia. That's a very good journal in the realm of metabolism. And it was published by the, uh, Summers and other uh, authors at Oxford. In this trial, they used a fairly small group which itself is a problem, only 17 participants. And with just these few participants, they had quite a variety of subjects with type 2 diabetes, people who were obese, and non-obese, also non-diabetics. So you can see that they have multiple groups within just a group, within a study population that only included 17 people. That is very low. However, there aren't a lot of studies for us to choose from. Now, they had these uh, study subjects follow two five-week diets, one rich in saturated fats from dairy and, of course, processed foods, and another emphasizing polyunsaturated fats from spreads and oils like sunflower or safflower. Now, as I noted earlier, all, all of these diets are confounded by fairly high carbohydrate levels, and so the carbohydrates were almost up to 300 grams a day, which is pretty heavy. That is an important consideration. These are high-carb diets. 
Now, nevertheless, with all of those limitations in mind, they used a gold standard to measure insulin resistance, namely the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. And the team found that the PUFA-rich diet improved insulin sensitivity, particularly in the women and the non-diabetic subjects, compared to the saturated fat-rich diet. Now, I'm going to revisit this in a moment and provide some, I hope, helpful context. But again, compared to the saturated fat-rich diet, the PUFA-rich diet fared better with regards to insulin signaling. Now, let's move on from this study and explore other trials that, again, specifically investigate linoleic acid-rich polyunsaturated fats and their effects on insulin resistance. A 2018 study by Miller et al. in the Journal of Nutrition randomized 29 healthy subjects to a diet providing 15% of energy from omega-6 PUFAs, of course, predominantly linoleic acid rich from seed oils, versus a saturated fat rich diet for four weeks. They observed a slight reduction or improvement in the HOMA insulin resistance score, indicating a subtle improvement in insulin sensitivity on the PUFA rich diet. Similarly, a 2007 trial by Goff et al. in a good journal, Metabolism, involved 35 overweight men in this case consuming 10% of energy from linoleic acid via sunflower. And this was for six weeks. And they found about a 10% enhancement in insulin sensitivity based on their tests. Now, this isn't always unanimous. There is a study in 2015 published in the journal Diabetes, which is a very good journal again. And they looked at 61 obese insulin resistant adults. And they had a linoleic acid-rich diet, which was 8% of energy from sunflower oil versus a saturated fat-rich diet for 10 weeks. And they found no significant changes in insulin sensitivity. So these trials suggest that linoleic acid from seed oils doesn't inherently cause insulin resistance. Now, as another sort of, well, a brief tangent, um, I don't intend and, and didn't when I put some thoughts together for this lecture to focus on saturated fats. I have made it very clear in the past that I'm a great defender of natural fats, which are often rich in saturated fats. But I'm cognizant of the fact that I just highlighted some studies that suggest saturated fats are worse on insulin resistance than polyunsaturated fats. Uh, fats. I do think context matters which I'm going to come back to in just a moment. But before going on to that, I wanted to highlight some of the biochemistry that would indicate or reveal how it is that linoleic acid could be contributing to insulin resistance because I did show some studies. As much as the human studies get a little unclear, the animal studies are a little clearer and the cell culture-based studies suggest that there is some critical nuance, namely that the linoleic acid in its unadulterated state may be fine, but it's often adulterated. It is often altered. So first, how might we reconcile all of this? Peroxidation products like 4-HNE sabotage insulin signaling. I'd mentioned the IRS-1 effect in that Sassen paper. Also, there's evidence that the peroxidation products can hit AKT in a paper in 2019. Um, and then a 2018 paper in the journal Biochemica, a Biophysica Acta. Some of those titles are sort of a Greek origin. And that was a study by Ramsden, and they fed mice linoleic acid versus its oxidized derivatives. Um, and peroxidation tripled the amount of oxylipins that accumulated. Linoleic acid really didn't. So there's this direct effect, again, of the peroxidation product. Second, there's inflammation. These oxylipins will activate strongly a primary critical mediator in inflammation, namely NF-kappa B, which when activated dramatically increases the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Well, anytime you're increasing inflammation, which I've discussed abundantly in the past, you are promoting insulin resistance. So if these peroxidation products are the problem, and I do think they are, part of the connection to insulin resistance could be via inflammation. So in that regard, we would consider it 
where these peroxidation products are acting as a secondary cause because they're relying on a primary pathway, namely the inflammation aspect. But third, I can't really talk about mediators of insulin resistance without invoking my favorite, which is the sphingolipid ceramides. Now, why is it my favorite? It's because that is the, in fact, specific topic I've focused on the most as a direct cause of insulin resistance throughout my career, particularly during my fellowship studies in early years of having my own lab here at BYU. Linoleic acid itself is not a backbone or a, a directly feeding into ceramide biosynthesis, but its peroxidation products might activate that process. A 2019 redux biology study linked 4-HNE to ceramide accumulation via the activation of stress pathways in muscle tissue. Uh, similarly, a 2017 paper published in the Journal of Lipid Research suggests that linoleic acid's arachidonic acid metabolites could stoke inflammation, and then that is boosting ceramide accumulation. So linoleic acid is perhaps less and less the primary culprit but its peroxidation products more and more appear to be the problem.